Okay, so I guess you saw my resume on the previous screens and um, I'm with the Southeast Orthopedic Pain Team and um, <clears throat> we see commonly back, chronic uh, hip, neck, shoulder pain, uh, all can be interrelated and interreferred. Um, uh, most common causes of spine pain include trauma, arthritis, uh, deconditioning, which means just not well conditioned or exercising regularly, sedentary lifestyle, uh, using poor body mechanics, much like the picture of that cartoon and the man picking up the box improperly. Um, other things can cause it genetic deformities, such as um, uh, a, a lysesis or a scoliosis, uh, various uh, diagnoses that can contribute to that. Red flags include things such as aneurysms, cancer, infections. Those are things we really look for to screen prior to uh, initiating any treatment. And a lot of our studies are geared toward that if there is a significant history or we see clinical symptoms consistent with that. Aneurysms are uh, areas of expansion of the blood vessels and they can burst. Uh, the fellow, Mr. Ritter, on three his company years ago, he had uh, chronic back pain, which turned out to be an aneurysm. He subsequently died from that. So it's, it, these are important things to find. Uh, cancer, a lot of uh, cancers do metastasize to the spine and can present with spine pain. In addition, abscesses, uh, uh, if you've had a rheumatic fever years ago, uh, your heart, heart valves develop vegetations and those vegetations can easily attract bacteria that grow and you develop endocarditis. Endocarditis is an infection of the leaflets of the heart valve and they can release bacteria into the blood circulation. And I actually had a uh, case report that I uh, documented on a patient that presented with back pain from an abscess who had rheumatic, who had been previously treated with a rheumatic fever, but had developed an abscess in the spine uh, the bacteria can flow through the blood system into Babson's plexus of the spine and, and seed into the spine and create an aneurysm and grow slowly and cause problems. So those are things that we see occasionally, but they're not the most common cause of back pain. They're very, very rare. Uh, the most common cause that I see at this point for any type of spine pain is arthritic conditions or trauma. Let me see if we can switch sides here. There we go. Um, <clears throat> this is a good one. The doctor says you'll be out of here and back on the sofa in no time. Well, I'll tell you what. The first thing that will lead you to having back problems is being deconditioned and not exercising regularly. So a routine of exercise is very important. And getting started in the therapy program where they can review home exercises and even developing a home exercise program that you can do at home. Uh, a lot of patients that are heavier that may have other arthritic conditions I recommend aquatics exercises. It's very helpful and uh, it takes the weight off your body and really does uh, work you out and strengthen your spine, especially your core. And they have classes, Silver Sneakers offers classes uh, for those uh, in the retired realm. And uh, it's very effective. And it's something that you should look into a regular routine of exercise. Occasionally exercising can hurt you, but a routine of low impact exercises on a regular basis is the key. And that will keep you healthy and to keep your back strong. So that's something to consider in the future to prevent developing back problems. Um, <clears throat> so when I see a patient, um, you know, first thing we need to kind of assess that person. Uh, we need to have a good handle of anatomy. And I thought I'd just review some of the basics of anatomy of the spine with everyone today. And um, we have here, we have here is uh, a, a nice diagram or a picture of the vertebral body. And uh, these are the, in between each vertebral body is a disc that acts as a cushion. You see on the right-hand side, we have seven cervical vertebrae. We have 12 thoracic vertebrae. This is where the ribs attach, which tends to be a st pretty stable structure. We have five lumbar vertebrae. We have five sacral vertebrae and four coccygeal vertebrae, very small vestigial uh, joints at the very bottom of our spine. Um, at, the, at the junction of the sacrum, there's, uh, <clears throat> you can get <clears throat> something called disrap, uh, something called where you get a transitional vertebrae. 
Transitional vertebrae is where there's a, con a congenital defect where you might have partial connection of the lumbar to the sacrum or the sacrum is separated and one of those vertebrae in the sacrum become lumbarized. So you can have something called a transitional segment in that area. Um, the cervical spine has a lot of impact because it's carrying your head, which is very heavy. It's like a fairly heavy bowling ball. And that puts a lot of uh, stress and strain, especially in trauma along the cervical joints. Now, just to look at the anatomy here, you see the vertebral body here, and you see the facet joints. You see what's called the lamina across the back here, and then you have the spinous process. The, these structures create a canal right behind, right behind the vertebra, vertebral bodies and the discs. Uh, we find the spinal cord in the upper areas. So the spinal cord doesn't go throughout the uh, entire spine. The spinal cord is an extension of your brain. You have the medulla oblongata, and then you have the, uh, the pons. And down from there, the spinal cord enters into that canal, travels all the way down to about the L1, L2 lumbar vertebrae, then it stops. Then the nerves that come out that area continue down. And we call that the horse's tail or cauda equina. That is the name of the horse's tail that travels down from L1-2 down through the sacrum and out the little neural frame. And you see right in this area here where my cursor is on the lower part of your lumbar area. So each one of these little holes is an exiting nerve. And it's interesting because all the nerves have specific uh, go to specific areas of the skin, we call a dermatome, and all to very specific muscles, we call a myotome. So, and they, you can see the, the nerve root exiting here. You have a, um, a ventral and dorsal, ra dorsal ramus that join together to create motor and sensory fibers that travel down uh, either your leg or your thoracic area, your neck, arm, and that region, depending on where that nerve comes out. Um, this is a little bit better depiction of the vertebral bodies. Here you can see the disc or pad between each vertebrae. But when you just see the bones, you don't really see all the other structures. There's a lot of other structures integrated between these bones and joints. And you can see, it I picked this slide out because it really gives you kind of a little bit of a depiction of that. You see a lot of these little things that stick out, the spinous processes and the transverse processes and all these things, they're actually connection points for ligaments and muscles. So they provide leverage and support of the spine. So this is when it, this is where it comes in, where it's important to exercise and strengthen these structures slowly and progressively to keep them moving, prevent them from, from becoming calcified. Immobility, non-activity will create calcification of these uh, structures and in turn stiffening and loss of mobility. So the key is to keep these areas mobile and, and strong. And you do that in a slow, progressive process of regular routine of exercise. Um, here's the uh, anterior longitudinal ligament in front of the vertebrae, posterior longitudinal ligament, and the ligamentum flave. And this is an area where we pass the needle through the epidural space and the spinal cord fits right down into this canal. Here's a depiction of a, a uh, intervertebral disc. And I just wanted to show this uh, slide because it's interesting, the collagen fibrils are set up in a certain pattern in one layer. So there's multiple layers. It can be anywhere from eight to 12 layers of cartilage through that area. And the little chondrocytes that form the cartilage form in certain patterns. And you can notice it, they're, they're alternating patterns as it goes through. So it's almost like a little basket within a basket within a basket. And these are watertight baskets that encapsulates something called the nucleus propulsus. Now the nucleus propulsus, is the name of the structure in the center of the disc. It's the chewy nougat in the center of the disc. And it's uh, uh, proteoglycan, which is protein molecules attached to a sugar, long sugar, sugar molecule. Those proteins are hydrophilic, so they bind to water. So this is actually a gelatinous substance that binds to water that provides a cushion. So when pressure is pushed down on this disc, the forces along the, in, within that disc are equally distributed along the outer portion of that or the inner portion of that nuclear, of that inner nuclear uh, lamina or the, the inner layer of that cartilage. So force is equally distributed when pressure comes down. In fact, the, uh, ver uh, the vertebral bodies 
on compression, on when you compress the vertebral body, it will crush the bone at 1500 PSI or 1500 pounds. Um, the disc can take 3000 pounds. So this structure, when you're compressing it, is extremely strong. So when it's in good shape, it's very, it's an excellent way to dissipate force and cushion the vertebrae, actually stronger structurally than the vertebrae themselves. However, when we're pulling apart this disc, if we're bending forward and uh, pulling on these layers, they can tear and rent. And when you get accumulation of tears and rents within this annulus fibrosis, we call it the layers of cartilage, when this nucleus propulsus is under pressure, it starts to seep through those layers. And when that starts to seep through those layers, that's when we get a degenerative disc. Here we have a, a diagrammatic air, a picture of the, of the disc itself. Here you can see the nucleus propulsus and the annulus fibrosis, which are the layers of cartilage. And this basically is a picture that depicts the inner innervation of these structures. So when we talk about what's the most common cause of back pain, we have to figure out where that back pain is coming from. And there's several structures that can cause pain. And the disc is one of them. You can have a herniated disc that hits the nerve and it causes nerve pain, or you can have deterioration of the disc and you can have annular disruption where this ligament actually gets torn or stretched and distends and it stimulates these nerves. Now here we have the ventral gray ramus that innervates the uh, anterior uh, lateral one third of the uh, annulus fibrosis of the disc. And then you have the sinus vertebral nerves, which are a, uh, another branch of the uh, main nerve trunk that exits the nerve canal. And that actually innervates these structures. These are pressure sensitive and also have nascent pain fibers in there. And this is a common area of treatment. Uh, uh, IDEC procedures or heating that annulus has been a treatment in the past to uh, denervate or destroy these receptor sites that allows uh, to reduce pain from the disc. Uh, some of the newer treatments for managing disc, my, uh, disc discomfort and annular tears and structural damage to the annulus include stem cell and PRP injections in the disc. And some studies are ongoing uh, and ongoing research is being performed to see the response to that. And some of the studies are pretty hopeful. 60 to 70% of people undergoing those studies that would normally get a fusion in their back because of persisting uh, disc pain end up uh, not having to get surgery. So there, there, these studies for PRP and stems, intradiscal stem cells uh, treatment has been, um, is, undergo is undergoing and it, it seems to be pretty hopeful for the future in terms of managing. This is just another diagmatic uh, de uh, demonstration of what happens to that disc as it degenerates. And here you see normal anatomy where the lame lamellae or the annulus fibrosis is well, and the disc itself is well contained and the structure is intact. Here on the annulus fibrosis starts to break down. As the, you get little rents and tears in that cartilage, the material inside under a lot of pressure uh, can start to migrate and ooze through those layers and create degenerative change. And then finally, uh, that weakens the walls of the, of the annulus fibrosis and from trauma or uh, from excessive pressure within that disc, a herniation can occur. And here you see some of the nucleus propulsus, so gelatinous substance in the middle, uh, break through that area and uh, enter into the nerve canal where the nerve is exiting and also into the spinal canal where the spinal cord is. And it, this, this is, happens to be in the cervical spine in your neck and that can, could, could cause compression of the spinal cord and also the nerve root in that area. And uh, this, can, this can be treated sometimes with injections and uh, therapy and has a fairly good success rate. Uh, but when there's sensory motor deficits and progressive symptoms that are unresponsive to that, uh, surgery is the most common treatment for this. And that would include an anterior or, or posterior uh, decompression or anterior cervical discectomy and a subsequent fusion in that area. There's also uh, nowadays disc replacements that the surgeons can offer as well, which can be very helpful. Uh, again, I, I guess I'm driving this point home just so people can recognize this structure and understand its function and the, what happens as it deteriorates. But here's a normal disc. Again, you don't see the layers of cartilage there. It's not depicted on this 
diagram. The, this disk material in the center is a little bit larger than you would normally have, but it depicts this gelatinous substance that acts like a fluid under pressure. And uh, when there's disruption of these ligaments, that material can seep through and again, come in contact with the nerve root. And that's when we get something called sciatica in the lower back or radicular pain or radiating pain uh, from the nerve we call radicular uh, in that area. There's rid radiculopathy, which is injury and impingement of that nerve that might be, that describes a damage to that nerve. And there's radiculitis, where this nerve can cause a significant inflammatory response. So itis is inflammation, opathy is uh, damage or pathology. So it can cause damage to that nerve, or it can cause irritation around that nerve due to inflammation. Just like if you were spraining your ankle, you're just slightly tearing a ligament, the anterior talofibula ligament in the ankle most commonly, and that causes the whole ankle to swell up. So just that little bit of tear in the ligament just like in your back and the disc can cause significant inflammation. And that inflammation is like Tabasco sauce on the nerve. It'll light it up and you, you, it, you'll develop a radiculitis. That's best treated with injections and localized corticosteroids in that, in that area. And those are things that we do in clinic. Um, risk factors for spinal disease, as we described, there are occupational hazards. Clearly, if you're doing a lot of lifting, moving, uh, heavy weight and not being properly conditioned or using poor body mechanics uh, that can increase risk of injuries. Sedentary jobs, I think number one. Sedentary jobs create atrophy of those muscles that stabilize the spine. 90% of your spine is muscles and ligaments. 10% are those bones and joints that you see on, the, on those diagrams. Those bones and joints need to have stabilization of the ligaments and, and muscles across that area to support them. So any, any weight or forces applied to the spine can be distributed off those, joint, off those joints and discs to the muscles and ligaments. So they're very capable. Those muscles and ligaments, when they're strong and conditioned properly, have a high capacity to take on those excessive loads. And if you don't have that capacity, you end up getting injuries. And that, that, that's the main cause of problems from sedentary jobs. Um, as, you, as we age, unfortunately, um, uh, up to the age of 60, men about the same uh, as much as women up to 60, but after 60, women uh, have the predominant uh, causes of low back pain. And a lot of that's due to osteoporosis, subsequent uh, fractures and things like that. But age is a, a component. You get some desiccation or drying of that material within the disc. And uh, it's mostly due to poor circulatory changes on the vertebral end plates, which are the parts of the bone that feed to give the, provide nutrition for the chondrocytes that live within the cartilage. So if we go back, I can go back, but if you look in here, this cartilage is actually alive. There are cells that live within that cartilage. They're called chondrocytes. And those chondrocytes need nutrition just like any other cell. But you notice there's no circulation in there. So how do these, how do these cells get nutrition? So if we go back another layer or two. Um, we have these end plates right here. There's a capillary bed in the vertebral bodies where there's the capillaries come right up to the surface, right along the area of the junction where the, where the disc sits. And uh, that blood flow actually allows nutrients right near the surface of that disc. And the nutrients seep through those our, our capillary walls and uh, are driven uh, by osmotic pressures and uh, com compressile forces into the, verte into, the verte into the intervertebral disc material around the cartilage into this area and feeds those chondrocytes. Now those chondrocytes, these, these tissues do break down, but the chondrocytes can sometimes keep up with the damage and replace the cartilage that gets deteriorated and, and repair that. But it's, a lim it's limited. And as we live the, our lot, sedentary lifespan, our lifestyles, that blood flow on the vertebral end plates is deteriorated because it needs kind of that light compression and release to pump that, to create that osmotic pressure at times uh, to feed those chondrocytes. And as we age, those chondrocytes don't function as well and they can't replace the tissues and the, the tissues uh, tend to deteriorate more quickly. So by maintaining a low impact exercise 
even through older ages, is extremely important to maintain function and mobility. So I keep coming back to that routine of uh, light exercise. It's actually critical. Um, and it's good for your heart and lungs and everything else. So that's a, uh, what I really try to encourage my patients to start if they haven't been doing it already. Um, other issues that increase risk factors to spinal disease include the size and shape of the canal. That could be a congenital uh, thing that could be associated with degenerative changes that occur or um, injuries, compression fractures, all can change the shape of the spine, scoliosis, uh, slippage of the vertebrae, all those things, anterolysis, spondylolisthesis, all those other things that we'll talk about maybe later. Um, smoking, terrible, bad for nutrition, uh, bad for circulatory functioning, bad for uh, nutri providing nutrition to the, uh, that, those chondrocytes. It really is a very disruptive thing to do. It's not a good idea. Uh, ex extended driving. When you're sitting in a slouch driving position in most chairs, there's a lot of intradiscal pressures. Those pressures uh, uh, prevent that nice movement, that flow of uh, nutrition to the, to the disc and the, uh, the vertebral end plates. So by moving, standing, changing pressures, when you're sitting in a static position at high pressure, when you're sitting down, the pressures within the disc are uh, twice as high as when you're standing up. So if your pressures are 150 PSI with standing, they might increase to 300 PSI while sitting. And if you're bending forward, sitting and lifting, that the intradiscal pressures can go up exponentially. And again, that affects the circulatory functioning and also affects the chondrocyte health and also can cause stress to the ligaments around that disc. So the disc itself is quite an interesting structure. I don't wanna to spend too much time on it because we've got a lot of other things to talk about. But um, if you have any questions about the disc, disc problems, it'd be a good time to submit those, you know, and we can kind of go over some of those issues if you have those. So I kind of wanna make this a little bit more interactive because for me talking, I mean, you're probably, most of you probably, you know, probably start to daydream and kind of lose, lose sight of stuff. So it's good to be interactive with me. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them and go into any details. That's the point of doing this because we're going to touch a lot of topics and um, everybody has different problems that may be causing their, pro their pain. And I want to kind of uh, address those. If you have any uh, questions, please do ask. Um, you know, epidemiology, the prevalence of back, back pain or spine pain is huge. I mean, 50% of all adults have low back pain every year. That's a lot of people. And um, only 15 to 20% seek medical attention or it's bad enough to seek medical attention. Uh, it's the number one disability of Americans younger than 45 years of age. So that's a pretty substantial problem. And it's unfortunate because there's a lot of things you can do for the back problems now that would prevent this disability. What comes from disability is having this chronic condition that isn't getting better and it's not being addressed appropriately, then patients become disabled because of just the fear of doing things and the lack of doing things and the, the time that they took to, de de they become deconditioned and it makes it very hard to get back in the swing of things. So it's important to seek medical attention um, because there are a lot of preventative things we can do like therapy, teaching the exercise programs, um, Look, ruling out red flags and things like that that might be uh, underlying indolent problems like infections, cancers, things like that. Uh, so meeting with your primary care physician, but also that's something we really like to specialize in, in the, uh, the pain group here at Southeast Orthopedic. We wanna really try to provide conservative non-surgical treatment, but there are many people that need surgery. So it's a good way for us to capture a population of people that can benefit from our uh, treatment and we, we can offer all stages from simple physical therapy, exercise, to interventions, to surgeries. And so we, have the, we can offer the whole gamut. And uh, our goal as gatekeepers for these spine conditions is uh, trying to keep it as conservative as possible. Uh, but it's a very a common problem and uh, it keeps us all very busy. There's, I, there's a question, all right. We got a couple. <laughs> we got a couple, okay. 
What's the first question? Is there anything to incorporate safely walking backwards into an exercise routine to help alleviate or lessen my lower back pain? Likely originating mm -hmm. from deconditioning? Well, the best thing to do, I would say, in, in your case, if you're not working with a physical therapist, if, it depends on how deconditioned you are. If you're severely deconditioned, if you've been bed rest for over a week, um, that can, you know, from COVID and disease, people have been in the hospital for weeks. They, be, they come out severely deconditioned. One week of bed rest, you can lose 50% of your muscle mass. If you don't move for seven days, you, you lose 50% of your muscle mass, which is huge. It's like jumping off a cliff. You lose it very quickly, but to gain that back will take a year because that muscle, to build that muscle up, to change from a catabolic to anabolic state in your metabolism takes time and it takes effort and it takes focus. So what do you do? I, a lot of my patients, if they're highly deconditioned and they're overweight and they have arthritic conditions, I think aquatics exercises is great because it takes the weight off your body. Everything you do is against resistance in the water. They have classes at the Y. There's other aquatics programs offered where you can go do a re, uh, uh, actual uh, aerobics type exercises. Silver Sneakers offers it for a very inexpensive rate. And uh, it's a good way to get started, just getting moving, just doing a little bit at a time. But like I said, it's the routine of doing that exercise. It's, the, it's like brushing. I always use the example of brushing your teeth. You brush your teeth every day. You don't brush your teeth. Your teeth aren't going to fall out. I mean, you could probably not brush your teeth for a few months. Your breath might smell, but you'll probably be fine. But we all brush our teeth every day, twice a day. I mean, we're all taught that. And um, it, in the long run, it's very helpful because we tend to keep our teeth to a lot older age and, you know, and never have to lose our teeth. So it's the same thing. Ex exercise on a routine basis, similar to that, where you don't think about it. Like when you go get up in the morning, you don't go to the, look out the window and say, well, it's bad weather. I'm not going to brush my teeth today. You know, you just do it as a routine. So if you get an exercise program that you can do regularly, something that you can do regularly at a low, you start out very slow and easy and you slowly gradually increase that. It's good to be in a group setting where you can do that because then you get encouragement from others. And it's kind of fun doing things with other people. You know, it kind of increases your compliance to things like that. Trying to do stuff on your own like that. It's hard. It's, you need a lot of, you have to be super disciplined and there, I, there's, I know I'm not like that. So I go to, you know, I started doing 10 years ago and doing it regularly. And for me, it's been a godsend in terms of me being able to do the things I like to do. And certainly I would encourage everyone else to do the same, but it's a slow progress. Um, uh, sometimes getting a trainer at a gym and having them start an exercise program for you. You know, if it's really bad, you can come in to see us. We'll start you in a therapy program. They can, they can evaluate you, see where your weak points are, and then they can set up an exercise program that you can do either at home or even advance to like a gym program that you can do on a regular basis. So uh, <clears throat> that's a good question because it's, it's so important because really it's prevention that's the big thing. The problem is, unfortunately, most people that uh, address us with pain either had trauma and you can't really prevent that, uh, or you, they've had chronic deconditioning or arthritic conditions that develop and they, because of their pain, they really haven't been that active because it, it increases their discomfort. So it's a difficult problem, but you need to start slow and easy. And um, there are a lot of different avenues to go to, but I think working with a trainer in the beginning, just for a few visits to have them set you up, if you're not going to go to into the medical system, I know that can be kind of arduous but it can be very helpful because there are a lot of very skilled therapists that can really identify those problem areas and set up specific programs and then get you into a general program as well, which is really key. So what's the other, what's the second question? Because we don't finish this tonight. We can always come back and do it another night and finish it up. But I, I think it, it's more interact. I like the interactive nature of the questions and things like that. I am thinking about starting aquatic exercises now. Is it better in the deep end of the pool or the shallow end of the pool? I have a herniated disc with degenerative disease with mild scoliosis. Well, I certainly would start in the shallow end. <laughs> Depends if you can swim or not. But um, I would probably start in the shallow end. I would work in a class and just do light motion where it's not painful. And um, you do what you can. If it hurts, 
you have to back off and just do what you can that that doesn't hurt. Maybe it just starts to hurt you back off a little bit until you're doing those activities. And over time, uh, most patients, even with a, a herniated disc, even with a little uh, sensory and stable sensory or motor impairment, do improve substantially. And uh, 60 to 70 percent of those people do get better. Um, and here we have the natural progression of low back pain. It kind of dovetails right into what we're talking about here. 70% of patients from uh, low back pain that occurs spontaneously, 70% uh, improve within two weeks. 90% uh, of patients improve within six weeks. So by entering into a program, because you haven't been doing anything and you're deconditioned and you want to get started on something, it's probably a good idea to start without back pain, but if you have back pain, you have to be conscientious with a slow progressive movement and a gentle mobility in the beginning. And working with the therapist is sometimes the best thing to do because some of the activities, I can't go into all the details, but some, especially it depends on the kind of back pain you have, whether it's joint related or disc related, nerve related, you're gonna have different kinds of exercises. And, um, but you can see by the numbers here that there's very good, uh, recovery from that. And the key is prevention. And the, the stronger you are, the, uh, and the, the, the more consistently you do these uh, programs, the better you'll be in the long run, the less likely you'll have recurrent pain. Uh, there are 3% of patients who don't improve after six to 12 weeks. Uh, a lot of those patients end up seeing me. And there's a variety of things that can be contributing to low back pain, but low back pain that that's not radiating uh, most of the patients that I see either have a joint related pain complaints uh, because of arthritis of the small joints we call facet joints or SI joints. And that uh, those joints have specific properties that create muscle spasms throughout the spine. And I'll go into that uh, with a little more detail. Um, here we, have, we found the source of your pain. You have a compact disc. Oh, look at that, a CD, but no, people don't even know what a CD is anymore. <laughs> okay, so when a patient comes in, the first thing I wanna do is get a good history because it's really important because you wanna rule out the red flags, number one. Number two, you wanna really kind of get an idea of how long has this pain been going on for? Has it been chronic? Does it come and go? Is it something that just started and progressively worsened? Is it... Uh, was there an injury of some sort that might have uh, precipitated this event? Um, does it stay just localized across the back? Uh, does it cause muscle spasms? Does it track down into your buttocks or hips? Or does it go all the way down your legs to your feet? So all those things have specific uh, criteria that I look for. Uh, I also ask about what, what makes it worse and what makes it better. It's very helpful in determining the diagnosis for that because Spinal stenosis, for instance, which is narrowing the spine where it pinches the nerves because the spine, spinal canal is actually narrowing down and, and acting like a noose on the nerves. So, and that happens in a lot of patients over 60 years old, it's very common. It's, and it's an active person's disease as well. And uh, because you're, when you're standing and walking, the canal narrows and symptoms become more uh, prominent and they'll get what we call neuroclaudication complaints or compression of the nerves. And you'll feel cramping and discomfort across the legs and feet. And you sit down, your pain goes away. When you stand up and walk, your pain gets worse. And there's something called the positive shopping cart sign. As when you're at the grocery store shopping and leaning forward with the cart, it's great until you have to you let go of the cart and have to walk up standing upright where the canal narrows again and, it, and you'll get those symptoms. So that's uh, spinal stenosis. So what makes it worse and better are kind of critical things for me to look at to determine where this pain may be coming from. Because for me, I wanna know where the pain is coming from uh, because that way we can ad address our treatment to that specific area. So a lot of things I do are diagnostic. So I might inject a little joint like a facet joint or the SI joint, I might anesthetize that area. If I anesthetize a spot and your pain goes away, it's a good bet that that's where your pain is coming from. And then we can address treatment for that. And there's several treatments for joint discomfort, which include ablations and there's fusions and things like that as well that can uh, be provided by the surgeons when uh, the joints become un highly unstable, uh, especially in the disc or the vertebrae and puts the nerves at risk. Um, is there any weakness or sensory motor deficits, uh, what we call uh, motor deficits 
or uh, sensory deficits associated with it. And that gives an indication, is there nerve involvement? Usually nerve involvement involve, uh, creates uh, weakness or numbness, but sometimes it's just a pain, that uh, electrical shooting pain that might extend down an extremity in a specific dermatome. And each nerve, as I said, has a specific dermatome. Those, that's the sensory portion of the nerve in a specific pattern and uh, a myotome that occurs in a specific muscle group. So if I wanna know if you have a specific nerve injury, I'll look at certain muscles to see if that there's weakness in those muscles. And that'll give me a good insight into where the problem might be coming from. Um, is there bowel bladder dysfunction? Now that is a result of what we call cauda equina syndrome. And remember the horse's tail that we discussed, uh, that's compression of the horse's tail. So the nerve roots can slowly get compressed. And that's a slowly progressive problem called equina syndrome. And that will result in bowel and bladder functioning. And usually, and most likely, that will occur at or above the L3-4 level. And uh, so it, the vertebrae L1 through L5 are the lumbar areas. And those are the common, most common areas to develop degenerative problems, especially L5-S1. Now, when you get up to L3-4, above L4-5 and L-S1, uh, that's where you have to worry about bowel and bladder problems. And our, we have a, a little saying, uh, L3-4 keeps it off the floor. So if you lose bowel and bladder functioning, it's usually at or above the L3-4 level. Um, go back here. So a physical exam is very important. We look at tenderness, uh, sensory motor deficits, we measure those, range of motion limitations. So tender points and palpation over the lumbar spine or those areas uh, are helpful in maybe determining potential areas of joint involvement or bony dysfunction, but we're palpating predominantly over muscle too. And a muscle spasm can occur because of nerve or joint problems. Uh, weakness in the extremities or sensory uh, motor loss uh, would indicate nerve problems as I mentioned. And range of motion limitations are predominantly, could be due to muscle spasms, uh, but it could also be due to arthritic changes or uh, hypertrophic changes of the joints. In other words, as those joints deteriorate, they become hypertrophic or expanded and they progress, have developed progressive limitation mobility. Uh, the other tools that we like to utilize in, di in uh, diagnostic imaging include x-rays, Okay, uh, CT scans, which is an x-ray, but it's a three-dimensional x-ray, which is really good for looking at bleeds in your brain. It's very good for looking at fractures of different uh, structures. Spine x-rays are very good for looking at motion of the spine. We can get flexion, extension, alignment, scoliosis, degenerative changes, uh, joint arthritis, things like that. Tumors and masses can be picked up on spine x-rays sometimes. Uh, CAT scans uh, can pick them up a little bit better. Um, MRI scans, that's more or less the gold standard. So CT scan uses x-ray. Uh, MRI scans use magnetics. So it's called magnetic resonance imaging. So they use a huge magnetic field. And it basically takes the little water molecules in your tissue, and it makes all the hydrogen atoms go to one side. And then when they turn the, the magnetic field off, those electrons pop back into position. And uh, when they pop back into their position that they're drawn from, they release a, a little packet of energy. And that little packet of energy gets uh, recorded on the scanner. And that's what we see. So all the tissues have specific concentrations of water. And uh, based on that concentration allows us to actually see the difference between all the different layers of soft tissues. So it's very good for depicting soft tissue abnormalities like disc herniations, tumors, uh, things like that. So myelograms are injections of dye into the spine. And usually that's uh, piggybacked with an, a CAT scan. And that gives, if you can't do an MRI of a pacemaker, uh, sometimes a CT myelogram is the best way to assess compression of nerves or spinal cords and things like that. EMG, NCV. That is called electromyography and nerve conduction studies. So if we think that the patient may have a pinched nerve, we might order uh, an EMG test that might pick up abnormalities or damage to the nerves that are reflected in the muscles. So by testing the muscles, you can see if the, some of the nerves are injured. 
uh, conduction studies are very similar, but they're also helpful in differentiating other things like carpal tunnel syndrome. Someone has carpal tunnel syndrome and it's bad, it can radiate up into your arm proximally as well, a similar, and it can mimic a, uh, a radicular type of pattern of pain. So uh, sometimes when we're not really sure if there's a compressive problem in the, across the wrist, i.e. carpal tunnel syndrome, or if there is a, uh, a pinched nerve in the neck, uh, it's uh, the EMG NCV study is very good one. I have a, a client of mine that I'm taking care of, and she presented with a lot of what looked to be uh, radicular pain. And we got an MRI, and it wasn't terrible, but there was pathology in that area of the nerve. Uh, but you know, we did an injection around that area, didn't really work. And um, she continued to have numbs and tingling, developing both hands, really nothing compressing the nerves on the spine. So we are, uh, are, are diagnosed, we we're sending her for a nerve test in order to evaluate for what we call thoracic outlet syndrome. So as the nerves come out of the, out of the neck, they pass through different fascial areas like muscles, medial, there's the uh, middle scalene muscles where they come out of, then it goes through the clavicle, then the pectoralis minor. So there are different areas along the shoulder girdle, uh, even in really fit people that can cause compressions and have paresthesias. So there's a lot of different things that we use the EMG NCV studies for. In my specialty, that was one of the things that I would do frequently uh, as well, and it's helpful. They can be helpful. Discograms or discography, uh, we can do uh, injections into the disc. This helps us uh, determine the pathology of the disc. Also, if we put a little excess of pressure in that area when we inject, we, call, we can do something called a provocative discography. So if that disc is causing pain, we can actually elicit their characteristic pain by increasing pressure if they have discogenic pain. So that's helpful. And a bone scan is, uh, a, bone scan is an, a, a nuclear study where they inject you with very uh, low uh, radioactive substances. <laughs> And it's very, very good for looking at specific kind of tumors and occult fractures, these little fract stress fractures that may not show up very well on uh, x-ray studies and even sometimes MRI and CAT scan. So these are some of the tools that we use. Here's just an example of some of these things, x-ray imaging. Here we're looking at motion. So we have flexion here and extension here. And we do this to evaluate how these how the discs and the joints are moving. They're moving in a consistent pattern. Here you see a little straightening there. Um, also, if someone has rheumatoid arthritis, uh, one of the things we look for in flexion extension is the uh, odontoid, which is part of the C2 vertebrae that uh, extends up into the C1 vertebrae and the C1 vertebrae rotates around. And there's something called the transodontoid ligament that actually can, uh, be damaged in someone with rheumatoid arthritis. And that can cause, in forward flexion, can cause compression of the spinal cord. So those are things we look out for. Here's x-rays of the lumbar spine and part of the thoracic spine. Here you can see the ribs coming down. So that's the thoracic spine. And we have one, two, three, four, five lumbar vertebrae right there. One, two, three, four, five. Here we can see degenerative changes between the, the discs. Here we can see some arthritic changes along the joints as well. We can see the pelvic area. This is the iliac bone, and down here is the sacrum, and this is the base of the spine, and this joint, all the weight of the spine ends up on the sacrum, this bone here, and it distributes equally along both hips. The SI joint is a common area of pain, and uh, for instance, when I do my exam, one of the common questions I ask to elicit for SI joint pain it is the, if the pain is localized across their back. This can radiate into the button hip and groin as well. But if they elicit this pain with uh, sitting, then going from sitting to standing. So SI joint pain is very common, about as common as facet pain. And these are both very common problems. I would say one of the more common problems that we see. So, uh, you know, we don't, when we order advanced radiologic imaging, which would be an MRI, usually if it's just lower back pain and uh, the pain is severe, causing significant discomfort, uh, MRI scan would be indicated about, you know, uh, two months after uh, failure of conservative treatment. Uh, if it's associated with trauma, we might do that a little bit earlier. But if, if there's neurologic deficits from cardioquina, the pinching of that, that uh, horse's tail that we talked about, 
uh, where we have bowel bladder dysfunction, or if we see progressive sensory or motor deficits where you have weakness or numbness in the extremities, and we think that's coming from your spine, MRI scans might be uh, something that we might do right away, depending on patient's clinical symptoms. Um, here's just a picture of an open MRI scan. A lot of times they're closed in the tubes and we'll show that, but this is an open MRI, which people tend to tolerate a little bit better. They don't have quite as good uh, imaging quality, but they are, they are uh, very, very helpful. And here we have a closed tube and it's a long tube and some people get claustrophobic and have a difficult time in there. And if you're a large person, some of these tubes are not so large. Um, here's an example of an MRI of the lumbar spine. Here, this is the sacral spine, these two segments here is in the sacral area. And here we have L5, S1, the L5 vertebrae, vertebrae and S1. Uh, we, we see some progression of disease. Here we have a fairly normal disc. It's a little darkened, so there may be some degenerative change of that disc. The ligaments here look pretty good, maybe a little bulging there. Here we have a lot more a desiccation or darkening of that disc where that material tends to start to desiccate through the material and is even coming through to the last layer and extending out. We call this an annular tear. So that, at new, that uh, annular fibrosis uh, is torn and that material from the inside the gelatinous substance that acts like a fluid under pressure is squeezed through and it's starting to come out right there. And that what that's doing, that posterior longitudinal ligament that I had pointed out earlier um, is being stretched. And there are nerve endings all around this area. And this can sometimes be a painful structure and can be related to trauma. Uh, there's controversy about whether or not that's, you know, can be a painful structure or not. But here I wanna point out this disc is more advanced. There's more, more advanced degeneration. You notice how the height of the disc deteriorates as you go down. Normally, it should get bigger. From here, this disc should be bigger than this. This, this disc should be bigger than that. And it's half the size. So that's just demonstrating how that disc is being squashed between the two vertebrae and how the disc is bulging out of the sides, front and front, uh, in the uh, dorsal and ventral aspects. Here you can also see pressure along the vertebral end plates. And this is when I talk about the capillary flow and in the uh, nutri nutrition of that, those chondrocytes within the disc. Here, what's happening is because of compression, you're getting edema in the bone. And that edema is, is, causes pressure and inhibits capillary flow. So it's kind of a cascading event. And as the disc, as you're causing injury to that joint, more pressures putting on specific structures of that bone inhibits the capillary flow that inhibits uh, nutrition to the chondrocytes that perpetuates and progresses the deterioration of the disc. And over time, this, you know, several years from now, this disc will probably be bone on bone and there'll be a lot of, lot more reactive changes. We call modic changes of the bone and edema. And uh, that is usually ends up with a fusion, a spinal fusion, unfortunately, but if it's symptomatic. Some people it's not symptomatic though. Um, here is an MRI scan of a cervical spine. And here you can see something called stenosis. It almost looks like an apple core, okay? Here you have a disc herniation posteriorly from the disc. And here you have arthritis of the joint pushing the other way. And in the middle is a spinal cord. And this is not very good to see. Uh, this MRI, I think it's a lateral picture, so it's not the whole spinal cord, but it certainly is part of the spinal cord that's at demonstrating significant compression. You see this white in there that could be edema in that area as well, and that could certainly contribute to a nerve injury of the spinal cord, which would be reflected in your uh, maybe your upper extremities since it's around the C4-5 and may cause hyperactive muscles because it's an upper motor neuron lesion. Uh, you uh, inhibit, uh, you uh, turn off the inhibition from the brain that turns off motor function and you get spasticity. So you'll get, um, and that's, that's another issue we can talk about here is an MRI with someone with cervical trauma. Here you see a uh, traumatic spondylolisthesis. So spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis are uh, results, can be results of trauma. Sometimes in the lower lumbar spine, it can be congenital. Um, but with a traumatic spondylolisthesis, you see a slippage of the vertebrae. So we see a grade two uh, spondylolisthesis.
some questions? But yeah, let's do some questions after that. Sorry, I got it. I got on a roll there. What is spinal stenosis and can it be reversed? Well, spinal stenosis, as we saw on the previous slide, is narrowing of the spine. And uh, really, most of the time, the best treatment for it is surgery. Because if it's bony stenosis, uh, not, you know, you really have to cut away some of that tissue to open up the space. So a decompressive laminectomy uh, is usually performed in that case if it's severe. It depends on the clinical symptoms. If the clinical symptoms are mild and the, the stenosis is mild to moderate, even moderate to severe, you can live with that. Your body has a lot of, a, your body and spine are very adaptable. They're, they're very resilient and um, you can tolerate a lot. But once you start to get symptoms that don't go away and that are really limiting your function and mobility, you don't want to wait too long because you don't want to have damage to the nerves. The key to surgery is to do it in a timely manner when you don't develop damage to the nerves. So I'm quite aware of that. I'm hyper aware of that when I see my patients. So when we treat them, you know, we'll see, we might do an injection or two to see how they respond. I've had patients that come back a year later and they have no symptoms and they're still doing great and they have moderate to advanced stenosis and they're doing fine and they're neurologically stable. So it all depends, uh, you know, it could look really bad and be fine. But in this case that you see on the cervical spine, this is probably something that needs to be addressed right away. Uh, this would be not, not a very uh, attainable situation for someone. It could lead to further damage, especially if they had any other additional, if they were minimally symptomatic because it was only part of the spinal cord being compressed, any injury could lead to more dramatic problems. And that would be something for the surgeon to see. Um, and here you see the same thing. It's developing a little stenosis and you can even see the spinal cord, a little bit of edema in there. You don't wanna be seeing much edema in the spinal cord because that's just swelling inside the spinal cord. And when you put pressure on those nerves in the spinal cord, they're very sensitive to compression and that can cause uh, myelopathy, something called myelopathy where it's upper motor neuron lesion versus a radiculopathy, which is a lower motor neuron lesion. And that's something we can talk about another time. <laughs> but there are kinds of nerve injuries and they present differently that we can recognize. That's why it's important to go see the doctor because you know, he'll be able to point some things out if it's really serious. And that would be the, the, the best case scenario to catch something early on. Um, so basically causes of lower back pain we discussed is kind of a little bit redundant but uh, deformities like kyphosis, lordosis, scoliosis. So scoliosis is a, a more or less an S-shaped S cur uh, curvature to the spine. It can be in partial one area, but it can include the entire spine. That changes the biomechanics of the back. And some people with scoliosis can be very advanced and have severe scoliosis, very, very pronounced um, uh, changes where you actually see the rib cages resting against that iliac bone, your hip, your hip bone. And it can cause a lot of discomfort and even lead to neurologic disorders. Um, <clears throat> kyphosis is a condition where you have your flex, your spine is severely flexed. So rather than being straight, it's flexed forward like that. Lordosis is the opposite way. The lower part of your back is a nice lordotic curvature. Your neck has a nice lordotic curvature, and that can be reversed based on trauma and things like that. So those are the type of deformities, fibromyalgia, emotional stress. Uh, when you have emotional stress, your serotonin levels go down, your susceptibility to pain, your release of endorphins, all those things become minimized and your perception of pain quadruples. So anything that is causing a little bit of discomfort is now causing a lot of discomfort. So emotional stress, uh, any type of stress can lead to that because it affects the hormone balance in your body, including, uh, serotonin, as well as uh, other hormones, C-reactive proteins and things like that. It, it's very important. Exercise works better than taking a antidepressant for this. <laughs> so that's a good, good way to kind of distract yourself from things like that. Uh, vertebral compression fractures, infection, osteomyelitis, abscesses, arachnoiditis. Okay, so infections can cause a lot of different things. It can affect the bone, we call osteomyelitis. An abscess is, an, is a separate capsulized infection that expands sometimes within the spinal cord and that can compress the nerves and cause nerve damage. Arachnoiditis is an inflammation of the, of the tissues that can occur from an injury, a surgery, and uh, patients get scar tissue in the spine and adhesives around the spinal cord or spinal roots. 
osteomalacia is thinning of the bone, that can lead to compression fractures and pain. Uh, cancer clearly expands into the bone, into the spinal canals, and can cause uh, uh, multiple different complaints. Uh, patient can have referred pain in the back from their kidneys. They can have a kidney infection, a bladder infection that can refer into your kidneys, hips, and groin. Reflex sympathetic dystrophy is another condition that occur from any type of trauma, causalgia, uh, complex regional pain syndrome. These conditions, uh, one or two, these conditions can occur that are unrelated to the spinal canal. However, many of the treatments are along the sympathetic ganglion around the spine. So we treat the spine because that's where the ganglia, the cell bodies of the nerves that are involved in sympathetic, uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy it is. So we might treat the spine to treat pain in the hand. Um, <clears throat> uh, do you have any more, are there any other questions? Yes. Okay, let's hit some questions here. What kind of diagnostic criteria does a specialist consider in order to recommend either a low back pain pain management intervention or a surgical procedure? Well, I think going to someone who works with surgeons and can recognize surgical pathology and someone that can recognize other pathologies that may be uh, important to identify. Uh, so simple back pain can be just simple back pain and usually it is, but maybe not. So it's kind of good to have someone with a little bit of background and knowledge that can kind of direct you to those path pathways. And that's kind of what our department really does. And that's why we dovetail so well into an orthopedic setting uh, because we really help uh, bring that together because we see patients <clears throat> with hip pain and um, their hips x-rays are fine or there's a little bit of arthritis maybe they get surgery but then they still have hip pain and they can get referred pain from the back into the hip joint pain commonly si joint facet joint pain in the spine where there's small joints of the spine can radiate pain into your buttock hip and groin and can commonly met, be misdiagnosed as uh as hip problems so uh, we, we, we see a lot of the patients that have uh, been evaluated by our hip surgeons. Um, shoulder pain as well. A patient can have a neck problem. It inter a lot of those neck problems like a C6 or C5 radiculopathy where the nerve is pinched at C5 and 6 can affect the muscles of the shoulder. The shoulder can develop into problems. They can get adhesive capsulitis and other problems. Uh, shoulder pain just from the shoulder can radiate down your arm and that can mimic radicular pain. So there's uh, there's... Uh, a lot of overlap in the things that we do. So it's good to get someone that can at least look at you and see what's going on. It doesn't mean you have to get surgery or injections, but you might just need some therapy, a little bit understanding, home rec exercises, and sometimes a simple muscle relaxant or an anti-inflammatory might be helpful with, along with an anti, along with that, if you're able to take medications like that for the short term. And um, so, I mean, when we see acute lower back pain, it's different than chronic lower back pain. In acute lower back pain, it might be due to a trauma. Uh, something happened, they might've fallen or just kind of came up out of nowhere. Uh, but usually acute lower back pain is less than three months. So if you've had pain for less than three months, we still consider that an acute, an acute setting. Um, and now there's different kinds. There's non-radiating, which means it might be localized to the back or buttock area, or there may be radiating lower back pain. And the differentiation between referred pain and radiating pain. So referred pain is pain that is transmitted from an area into another area. Radiating pain is nerve impingement that causes nerve-related radicular discomfort or radiculitis. So there's those radiating symptoms. It's pretty important to be able to differentiate referred pain from a joint that, radiate, that refers pain into your groin or hip versus a nerve impingement that causes radiating pain into a specific area. So there's, there's subtleties that we, we describe in that. Uh, initial treatment is the same for uh, both non-radiating and radiating pain, which is initiating therapy, anti-inflammatories, uh, medral dose pack, uh, st uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, as I said, muscle relaxants, uh, initiating a course of physical therapy, uh, low impact exercises, home exercise program, ice, heat, other modalities can be uh, quite helpful as well, just to get through that acute phase. Um, if we see patients, obviously with bowel bladder dysfunction or progressive weakness or numbness, uh, our conservative treatment changes to more uh, diagnostic treatment where we might consider more uh, imaging, such as more advanced imaging like MRI scan. Um, 
So you have to be careful with some of these treatments, heating pads, obviously, that was not a good idea for him, but now he has no back pain, so I guess it was good. <laughs> um, so an acute lower back pain treatment, uh, rest for a few days, but any more than two days of bed rest actually causes increased deconditioning of the muscles along that area, and they found on studies that actually increases your risk of persist having persisting pain. So a uh, day or two of rest at most, and then back doing those gradual stretching and activities are sometimes the best, best things to do. Um, ice, heat, like I said, modalities, that includes modalities that might, might be uh, one of your uh, muscle uh, massagers as well, non steroidals analgesics, muscle relaxants, uh, medrol dose pack, as I mentioned, chiropractic treatment, acupuncture, and even uh, physical therapy might be helpful for these conditions. Um, Non-rating lo lower back pain, what are the causes? Uh, muscles, muscle pain, ligament pain. That might last a few days, maybe a week or so. But if you're in pain more than two weeks, the muscles are reacting to something. Muscles usually will heal within that time period, unless there's a big hematoma, that might last a little bit longer. But usually muscles are pretty, very, very re resilient structures. And unless there's a ligament injury or a joint injury, that is usually underlying a continued muscle spasm. And I always uh, I have an, uh, I always, when I see my patients and they come, they present to me with muscle spasms after a trauma, acute injury, and it la it's been lasting for six weeks, let's say. Um, <clears throat> one of the things about uh, lasting that long is it's no, they're, they're complaining mostly a muscle spasm. And that's what they think. They think it's continued to be muscles that are causing the problem, but it's really the underlying structures. So when someone has a trauma, such as a car accident, and you know they're, your, your head's pretty heavy, it's like a bowling ball, you get hit, your head snaps back and forward. The small joints in your spine called facet joints their normal range of motion might be this small amount, maybe several mil millimeters of movement. But during that impact, that motion might increase to twice that. So that would like, I would liken that to taking my finger to the very end and then just taking it very quickly, bending it back and then back again. If I did that to my finger tomorrow, I wouldn't be able to move my finger. It'd be so swollen. And it might take months for that swelling to go down. And if there's ligament injury or joint pathology associated with that it might take a year or better to get better. And it might not, you know, I might have post-traumatic arthritis in that area, but that pain in that joint, my finger joint would be localized to my finger in your spine and all those little joints between each vertebrae, we call facet joints that we describe. Those joints live in a community of joints and your brain actually knows what position those joints are in and re relative to every other joint. And it keeps your head balanced right on top. So the simple act of just sitting upright, there's billions of things from receptors all around the, the little muscles and all around the nerves and the joints. There's billions of little receptors all sending billions of bits of information every millisecond to your spinal cord at each level. And it's being assessed with other down pathways from your semicircular canals to con that know where your head is, all that information is going at the same rate. That it, we, can't, we can't even come close in our own technology today to even simulate a small portion of that. That's how much information is going on at once. So when a joint gets injured, it sends a pain signal. It sends a pain signal to the spinal cord that sends a signal back to the muscles to tighten up. And it's, it's a survival mechanism that stabilizes that, quote, injured joint. The problem is when that joint is painful for a long period of time, those muscles, that signal continues and doesn't stop. And it results in chronic tightness of those muscles. And patients end up with their whiplash injury where they get chronic occipital headaches. You get, it pinches the greater occipital nerve. It gives you headaches behind your eye. It goes between your shoulder blades. It can radiate across your shoulder. And that's all associated with joint pathology that precipitates muscle spasms because of the, the, that positive feedback. So it's a complicated thing, but it's, it, it's, you have to recognize uh, when you're looking at patients what the causation might be. And it's usually joint related and we end up treating joint problems. So when we go into non-radiating pain, muscle, muscles, arthritis of the spine, a big one, those little joints in your spine 
become arthritic and they send those signals and that creates muscle spasm and restricted mobility. And it, can, and it really advances that restriction. Unless you get rid of that inflammation or turn the signal off, those muscle spasms persist. Uh, obviously cancer and fractures, osteoporosis, which leads to fractures, not normally causing pain in itself, uh, but osteoporosis really is osteopenia with associated fractures. That's the medical diagnosis. Spondylolisthesis, slippage of the vertebrae that we saw. Spondylolysis is where you have little fractures of bones called the pars interarticularis, where the vertebrae, vertebrae that are in normal position get fall forward and cause a spondylolisthesis. So spondylolysis creates a spondylolisthesis. And that's probably information you don't need to know. <laughs> Ankylosing spondylitis. Now this is a rheumatologic disease that can occur of the spine. So uh, people with uh, inflammatory bowel syndrome, psoriatic arthritis, other conditions like that, rheumatologic conditions can develop specific inflammatory conditions of the joints of the spine. And we call that ankylosing spondylitis. And um, that's commonly associated with SI joint pain in young, young people and things like that. So when I see someone with SI joint pain as a young person, just spontaneously, we, we will really work them up for an inflammatory arthropathy, psoriatic arthritis, uh, uh, things like that. Um, yeah, we saw that one before. And here we have again, stenosis to that question, narrowing of the spine. You really need to cut away this bone. Inge injections, exercise, nothing's gonna alleviate that. It needs to be opened up. Pressure needs to be taken off those, those nerves that are passing through that canal. Um, canal stenosis usually occurs in patients older than 50. It begins with low back pain and radiating pain in the legs. And you may not have much low back pain because when you pinch the nerve, you don't really feel it in your back. You feel the nerve pain down your legs. So you may present with just foot pain or, or cramping in the, in the calves while you're walking. Now that could be your circulation. It could be poor circulation. We call vascular claudication where the arteries aren't pumping they're stenotic and they're not pumping enough blood for the muscles to work, so they cramp. Or you have neurogenic claudication, which is where you're putting compression on the nerves. So as you're standing and walking, puts pressure on the nerves and you feel it down your leg, which is different. And the way to differentiate those two things is vascular claudication gets worse walking up a hill, but neuroclaudication gets better walking up a hill because when you lean forward, it opens up. And when you're walking up a hill, you're leaning forward a little bit. When you'll go down the hill, you extend back and it feels feels worse where it's less work for your muscles. So vascular claudication, it doesn't hurt as much. Um, you know, spinal canal stenosis can affect certain areas, one side more than the other. Uh, radiculopathy or sciatica in the lower lumbar area. Uh, one to 2% of patients have compressed or inflamed uh, nerve roots. This is the epidemiology of this. Most common levels, as I had mentioned before, L4-5 and L5-S1, the two lower levels, 90% of these uh, are the common cause of radicular pain. But I see radicular pain from all levels, depending on the pathology. Uh, mechanism is usually annular degeneration of that annulus fibrosis of the disc. It leads to fissuring or tearing of the annulus, which leads to disc rupture, which subsequently causes the discs to herniate and hit the nerve. And when you combine that with arthritis of the spine, you get radicular pain. So radicular symptoms increase from the disc with forward flexion, sitting down in a car, coughing, sneezing, all increased pain uh, with disc problems and sciatica. Decreased pain with lying down with your knees flexed and standing and uh, sometimes walking helps as well. Uh, radiculopathy treatment, 50% of a sciatic pain. Uh, some studies show that uh, recovers within a month. Uh, dynamic exercise traction is one thing that we offer. And, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, Motrin, uh, Aleve, uh, muscle relaxants, uh, and sometimes uh, opiate medications, but we try to avoid opiates if we can. Epidural injections can be helpful for persisting sciatic or sciatic pain that's really incapacitating. And there's different kinds of injections. I do a lot of transframinal injections because it puts medicine specifically in a location. And if I put medicine there and your pain is alleviated, it helps identify that area as well. So it has a diagnostic component as well as a therapeutic component. Um, interlaminar injections are, they spread medicine throughout the spine uh, in that region. Uh, 
Usually uh, injections, the indications for these are alleviation of nerve root pain. Um, surgery is uh, indicated if symptoms of progressive weakness or numbness occur, or if the pain is so bad they can't live with it and they, don't, and they fail conservative measures. So uh, there's approximately 280,000 uh, spine surgeries a year. Uh, this is where I work in the fluoro lab. We have a fluoroscopy or x-ray machine that's live that we can actually see where our needles are placed in order to treat these conditions. Um, here is an example of a transforaminal injection where we put a little medicine right under the pedicle into that where that nerve is exiting. And you can see the dye that's injected flowing underneath the pedicle and down along the epidural and into the epidural space. So here we can see uh, this occurring. Um, when you have facet disease or arthritic pain in your back uh, from those little joints, it can radiate into the hip, buttock, and posterior thigh. So you can see referral patterns of pain. The SI joint is another area we'll talk about, can radiate down the back of your leg, similar to a sciatica. And it's commonly misdiagnosed as sciatica as well. So uh, it's unusual for these mechanical problems in the facets or SI joints to go below the knee. It's usually worse with extension. So as you lean back, it puts more pressure on those joints and that flares the joint up. Pain is usually dull, toothache type pain, stabbing at times and is associated with muscle spasm. As I said, those joints feed into the spinal cord that feed back to the muscles to make those muscles uh, tighten up. And when the muscles are chronically tight, they tend to become very uncomfortable. You get all sorts of other problems associated with chronic contraction of muscles, trigger points and um, referral patterns of pain. So basically treatment for facet disease or arthritic disease is an exercise program, a stabilization program, we call it, where you do isometric strengthening of the core. So you're not moving back and forth and in, in increasing the inflammation of that joint. Unfortunately, as the more you move that joint, the more it gets inflamed. So the key is to stabilize it and strengthen around it and gent with gentle movement to reduce that inflammatory response. Facet mobilization is just that, moving that joint slowly and gradually to inc gradually increase its mobility without creating an increased inflammatory response. Interarticular injections are helpful for reducing that acutely, the inflammation with a little corticosteroid. Uh, most commonly, we use medial branch blocks to diagnose and treat those things. A medial branch block is the little nerve that innervates that joint. I can numb that nerve. If I numb the nerve and the pain goes away, that helps diagnose joints as a potential pathology. And uh, we do that as a uh, treatment to diagnose facet pain. And if that's effective, but the pain keeps returning, after two tries, we can do something called an ablation. And that's here at the very bottom. Ablation is the medial branch nerves. And this, hap this works great. Um, and I, if you've been a patient of mine, I always bring up my dad because he was retired and he wanted to play golf and literally could not swing a golf club because the arthritis in his back was so bad. He was uh, an OBGYN and uh, he wanted me to go into his practice, but I didn't want to practice OBGYN. <laughs> so uh, here I am. And uh, in his retirement, he just, he could not swing the club. He was bumming out. He really wanted to get out there. So he had bad stenosis at one level but he had mostly mechanical pain. We did the facet blocks, did great. The medial branch nerve blocks did very well. We ended up doing the ablation and he was back on the golf course three days a week for three and a half years. We started getting gradual return of symptoms and we ended up repeating it once and uh, he did great. Um, again, just to kind of go through what the facet joint is. Now you hear the disc here. The facet joint is the articulation between the two vertebrae. It's very important to have this structure. This structure has some of the weight bearing. So anywhere from 15 to 30% of the weight is placed on these joints. If you have degenerative changes of this disc where the disc height is decreased, more weight is put on those joints. And as you see, these joints are pretty small. It's about the width of your finger. And uh, can you imagine uh, half your body weight being 30% uh, of half your body weight being placed on these joints? It's a lot of load. And uh, these joints deteriorate quite uh, frequently, and it's an active person's disease. And you can see the motion as you lean forward, the joint opens up and decompresses. And as you go to extension, the joints close up and put pressure on those joints. That's why extension hurts and uh, flexion or decompression helps somewhat.
Um, here we have a typical injection around that, what we call the medial branch nerve. This is a branch of the, uh, the dorsal ramus, comes around the joint and innervates the, uh, the joint at that level and the one below. And it can even go to two, three levels down. So there, uh, so when we, when we model the body, there's a lot of variability and we take that into consideration in, in uh, treatment. But what we do is we numb that little area. Here's intraarticular injection, but, um, and you can see on x-ray what that looks like. And here is an injection around the medial branch nerve. And here's the, uh, that arthritic joint. Here's the nerve that's coming out of the spine. Here you can see the disc. And here you see that medial branch nerve of the ventral ramus right here, innervating this joint here and also the joint below. Uh, and you see the one at the lower segment. Here's an injection around that area. An ablation is a different instrument. It's a needle, but the very tip of the needle, anywhere from five to 10 millimeters, is actually placed along that nerve that sends the uh, pain information. And that can, that can uh, and what that does, it cauterizes this nerve ending. We call it an ablation. That nerve will regrow over time. However, it can take years. My dad, for instance, took about three years. And on average, I would say most of my patients that we do this on, it, uh, it lasts two to three years where they have uh, very good relief. I have patients coming back five years later, uh, but on average, I would say three years, I see. Um, and it, as I mentioned, sacroiliac joint dysfunction, here's another area in the lower back that radiates into the buttock and posterior thighs. Um, special tests, you know, an exam, it's tough. I like to see, I always ask, does it hurt when you transition going from sitting, if you've been sitting for a while to standing? And that's something that is uh, very telling. Uh, we look at how the spine is moving. The lumbar joints are moving great, but, the, um, but they're having tenderness across the SI joint region. If they're standing for a while and it causes significant discomfort, if they're having some apparent radiating pain that goes down their buttock and thigh and the posterior thigh, or they're having groin or hip pain that is unexplained by x-rays or arthritis of the hip, that becomes critical. There's Gillet's testing and other testing of the hip, compression testing and things like that, that may isolate that area. Palpation around the joint is an, is an area as well. It's commonly associated with piriformis spasm. And honestly, uh, I've been doing this for, you know, almost 30 years now. And, uh, Basically, I don't see much piriformis syndrome. It's usually piriformis is reacts to SI joint pathology. And I think a lot of these piriformis syndromes are really SI joint or facet joint problems manifested in that area. Um, it's common in pregnancy. When you're pregnant, you release a hormone called relaxin. Relaxin allows the hips to become more mobile. So when the baby's head goes through the pelvis, it, is, it expands and opens up and allows the head to pass through it. And in women, uh, it doesn't always fuse back to normal and you actually have a little bit of increased mobility. So I see a lot, of, a lot more um, SI joint pathology in uh, uh, Paris women, people, uh, women who've had uh, children, uh, even if they had C-sections, you still release the hormone. Um, so treatment for iliac joint dysfunction, similar to facet pain, NSAIDs, heat, ice, uh, correct leg like discrepancies. Sometimes patients have a little bit difference in leg lengths. Uh, SI mobilization, if physical therapy can be helpful. Interarticular injections on the fluoro can help reduce inflammation. And ablations of the lateral branch nerve, which are similar to the medial branch nerves, they're just going out laterally, uh, same nerve group. Uh, that's very effective. Other treatments include fusions. And uh, when their joint is that unstable or, or we're not, you're, you fail all these conservative measures, certainly a uh, fusion of that joint would be indicated. And here's a, a depiction of the SI joint. Uh, there's a little meatus right in the lower part of the SI joint. That's why we use an X-ray to get into that meatus to guarantee that you're in that joint. It, it's more likely that you'll get in that joint by going through that area. And so X-ray or doing this injection of a fluoroscopy, I think is really important. 